Hi, welcome to this four part video series on the Hong Kong Medical Licentiate Examination or HKMLE. I'm Dr. Marcus Marset, President of the Medical Licentiate Society of Hong Kong. What we've done is taken apart our live webinar from July 2020 and divided it into four parts for better accessibility. This video deals with general exam tips. Videos two and three cover the written and clinical exam respectively. The last part deals with internship and beyond. If you get some value out of these videos, please give them a like, subscribe to our channel, and at the top of your screen, hit the bell icon. My first burning question for you guys, um, when is actually the best time to apply and take the HKMLE exam? Raymond, would you mind answering that question, please? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raymond Jen. Previously graduated the University of Adelaide in 2013. And after working a while as a service resident in surgery, and I felt, I felt like, okay, I wish to go back to Hong Kong. So I started on my progress of applying to the HKLME. At the end, I returned by 2017 and started on working. Right now, I am a senior trainee and obtained my membership in surgery and as a trainee in general surgery in the PYNH of Hong Kong. I wouldn't say there's any exactly best time for me, but once I choose to go back to Hong Kong, I start on all the process to re um, prepare for the exam, look at the regulations I need to review before I return. But I think just for me, anytime you feel like you wanted to go back to Hong Kong, just go ahead, take the actions and prepare for it. What about you, Grace? So, hi everybody, my name is Grace. I am a graduate from King's College London in the UK in 2017 and now I'm working as a resident, a medical resident at Prince of Wales Hospital, uh, which is the university hospital for the University of Hong Kong. So I started applying and preparing for my exam during my internship year in the UK, so that's the first year after graduation and that's because I knew that I probably would like to work in Hong Kong for the foreseeable future. So that's why I did it then. And I, I agree with you as well, Raymond, if you do want to work in Hong Kong, or at least in the next five to 10 years, then um, go ahead and apply. Um, but if you're thinking of just working in Hong Kong for two or three years, then maybe there are other options. For example, the limited registration route, that's also quite popular as well. And what about you, Marcus? What, when do you think is the best time to apply? And take sure. Um, so I think I would generalize that. And really, it's like, um, if, if anyone out there in the audience is wondering, when's the best time to come to Hong Kong, I would say right away. So a little bit about my personal story, I had actually come to Hong Kong first. And I worked on a limited registration through Hong Kong U's Department of Ophthalmology for six years. And during that process, especially towards the end of the process, that's when I really started getting more serious about the exam. I felt more comfortable about being in Hong Kong. So if your question is about coming into Hong Kong, do it ASAP, do it as soon as you're ready, uh, don't delay. If it's about the exam, I think it's really an individual choice. I have to say, one never feels ready for it. So uh, you're gonna have to just do it at some point if that's part of your, your goals. Great, so do you mind taking us through the exam breakdown just to introduce our audience to what the exam is all about? As you said, right, um, there are three parts. There's the written part, there's the English part, and then there's a the clinical part. So the written part is split into two papers with 120 questions each. And you can have questions on biosciences, uh, pharmacology, and you can also have questions in medicine, surgery as well. So in terms of the level of the exam, I would say it's very much sort of kind of postgraduate level, but quite close to the membership level sort of uh, difficulty. Um, for the English one, and I'm assuming quite a lot of you are from Australia, so you know I'm expecting full pass on this. Um, it's essentially a three hours paper on uh, comprehension, and uh, so so you be given a passage to read, for example, and you have to answer some questions on it. And uh, there are also things like referral letters or uh, things that you might have to do in the exam as well. So if you've been practicing as a doctor already, that's actually pretty um, straightforward for especially Australian grads. And then you've got the part three, which is the clinical exam, and you can split it into four specialties. So you will have exams in medicine, surgery, uh, pediatrics, and ops and gynae. So in all of these exams, you will have history taking, examinations, um, and also some clinical skills. So for example, surgery, this could be um, suturing, 
uh, for Obzingani, it could be a pap smear. Um, so, and bearing in mind that in Hong Kong, they actually use real patients for quite a lot of their exams as well. So in pediatrics, you might see some syndromes, um, things that you actually have to work through. So yeah, I would say those are the breakdowns. Have you ever encountered other difficulties whilst preparing for the exam, be it the written exam, the practical exam, and the OSCEs? Marcus, would you like to take over, take that over? I suppose, you know, 15 years after medical school, there's already like the adjustment process to get used to psychologically that um, you're going backwards by 15 years. So, but, you know, it could be two years, it could be three, it doesn't really matter. The point is that everyone in their own way needs to make that almost like let go, just accept that um, the Hong Kong system requires that and embrace it. And in the moment you embrace it, something changes within you and you work harder, you become more interested in learning what it takes to do the exam. So there's that sort of mental pivot um, that's really important for, for staying focused for the exam and to get to that point of being focused. Um, other difficulties, well, it may not be as applicable for Australian students because, I mean, you already have the, these kind of like clinical OSCE type exams. Um, so those are very much uh, important. Um, but the style differences are, having said that, you can't assume that um, you're ready for the Hong Kong exam just because there's an Australian background. I think it definitely helps, uh, but you still have to make small adjustments here and there in how you present a case uh, for the exam, um, this sort of thing. I think that th those adjustments are very important. It's not really a difficulty, but it's an important point to note um, that's it's really mission critical for exam success. Um, other mm -hmm. difficulties, um, I, I, I really don't, I think those are the two, once you have that in place, um, then everything else sort of follows after that. You almost do what it takes in terms of the intensity and the hours and the dedication. Mm, okay, great. So you need a lot of grit to get through the exam, Absolutely. I guess. Absolutely, yes, definitely yeah. grit. Do you have any more specific resources that you would recommend to our audience that they should definitely not miss out on when preparing the exam? There are also different sort of cases books. So for example, I found a picture of this. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's what, yeah. Well. Surgery wise, that's your book right there. Yep. So yeah. you know, you can see the stuff right there. But anyway, so those ones are pretty good for your cases. Um, in terms, of, I know somebody, some of you asked about um how you could sort of get uh, close to yeah. sort of like local guidelines. So there are things like um, so you can uh, look at the Hong Kong COG website for um, sort of guidelines on, let's say, pap smear, and things like the immunization schedule for childhood as well. So those are all readily available on um, the internet. So if you do come across, um, if you do come across a picture, I mean, um, a topic when you're preparing for your exam, and you know, they're very guideline based, ask yourself, okay, could there be something applicable in Hong Kong? Could, would this be applicable in Hong Kong? So, um, for example, Obzingani, um, they either use their local guidelines or they use the RCOG guidelines um, in the UK as well. So, you know, for those things, um, you could use those things to, uh, um, to revise for. But, you know, just expect the unexpected as well. So for the written exam, um, you can get epidemiology questions that you would never be able to answer. And that's, you know, I think... Um, I don't know if we've said this before, but you know, the written exam is negative marking. So you get, get uh, a quarter of the marks deducted if you get it wrong as well. So you know, for the written, you know, if, if you don't know the epidemiology of the rate of, I don't know, smoking in Hong Kong, um, then um, just don't answer it or you know, make, a, make an educated guess. When it comes to, sort of, as I said, yes, yeah, study groups, that's very important. Um, and just getting familiar with the local graduates and the textbooks that they use as well, that would be quite useful. Is there anything that you guys wish that you knew before taking the exam? Like any pro tips? Do get familiar with the local diseases. So I'm going to be a little bit more specific now. So things like tuberculosis, that's very big in Hong Kong. So make sure you know sort of the treatment um, and you know the uh, complications of or the side effects of having some of the medications for TB, um, that's very important. And um, so, I mean, obviously you've been trained in Australia, um, but actually just knowing sort of that TB could be at the top of your differential list for almost any respiratory condition would actually really help and impress the examiner as well. 
Or actually, if you didn't know that, then they'll be like, well, what about something more common? Because obviously they've been dealing with the Hong Kong citizens. Um, things like NPC, so uh, nasal pharyngeal um, cancer, that's almost unheard of in other parts of the world, but in Hong Kong, you have to know this. Um, those are things that I didn't actually realize that I had to know. Um, and also hepatitis B, that's quite big in Hong Kong, and especially in sub certain universities, and you know, they're very big on their hepatitis, hepatitis um, uh, research as well. And then I would say, um, have fun as well. So actually, this is an exam, and I know it's very daunting. A lot of you um, have been counting the statistics, wondering how like you're going to pass, how many questions do you need to do to pass, um, and you know, is the pass rate actually five percent? Actually, it's not five percent. It's a little bit higher than that, and probably um, even higher for um, the so graduates from Australia, Europe, um, as well in other sort of countries with very similar background. But actually, have fun. That's very important. This is the first step to um, get to work in Hong Kong and you will make so many friends along the way. Um, so having a study group is a good way to start having friends, uh, join a society is good, um, you know, to get to know the people as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I've even gone on holidays with some of the licentiate uh, mm. people I met in the exam. So, you know, have fun. And I think that's almost underrated. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can take more than one attempt, that's, that's okay. Um, but you know just know that know what you're doing and if you don't if you don't get get it if you don't pass on the first one that's fine just keep going know what where you've gone wrong and keep trying um at the end of the day they are trying to train you to be uh, one of the doctors in hong kong so you know don't be, don't be too disheartened if they do things in a different way to the ways you've been practicing have an open mind that's all i would say really mm. and what about you marcus um do you have any pro tips at all Pro tips. Uh, I really like what Grace said about um, at the end of the day, they're trying to train you or get you ready to be a Hong Kong doctor. I think in that regard, the exam is very fair because it does emulate the style, content, um, approach as the local university exams. Um, and so I think it's just a little bit different for a lot of people. And that's what throws a lot of people off. But um, it's definitely an achievable goal. I think a lot's been said about Hong Kong in the last year. And I have to say, and you know, today's 18th of July, 2020, and I love Hong Kong. So if you have any doubts about Hong Kong, uh, we all love it. We're here for you. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a place to have a great career and help people. And, and uh, as Grace said, make friends. Um, specifics. Uh, for the clinical exam, I have to say that I became very good friends with the Kiki Medics app. Uh, they have oh. videos on YouTube, but I always um, advise people to spend, uh, it's like one US dollar, a very, a one US dollar, very well spent because it organizes. Yes, you can watch it free on YouTube, but just spend the buck and then you have it in the app and they're all very organized. Apart from that, there's also some templates for history taking. Um, I, pl I printed those out and then I put like checks that I went through. Actually, Raymond's on this webinar. Uh, Raymond and I uh, became very good friends to the exam process. We peaked out right before that week before, maybe a week and a half or two, right before the clinical. We were studying 15 hours per day, but you don't even feel it. You don't even feel it. Once you're in the zone, then you just, you're just, you're ready for it. And like Grace said, you enjoy it. I still look back actually at it. And it was a great period of my life. I've met some lifelong friends through the process. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, do it. If you're thinking about coming over, come over. Mm. So I guess that pretty much wraps up our panel discussion. Thank you guys so much for sharing all of this really useful insights. I'm sure our audience has a lot to take away from this. And now we will move on to the live Q&A session. So we have uh, several um, like general questions about the internship and like, you know, on call uh, stuff. And there are also specific questions directed to each of the panelists. So I guess we can start from um, the general questions first. How did you get a acquainted with the local epidemiology with Hong Kong. I guess Grace kind of touched on that. It's mainly just about the websites and the guidelines and, um, you know, vaccination schedules and all of that. So um, I think it's just 
about if you go through a topic, um, just wonder if things are done differently in Hong Kong, um, then just go and search it up. There are some medications that aren't used. I mean, to be honest with you, it's quite difficult to answer this because even right now I'm learning um, things as I go along. Like, I didn't realize that melanoma was basically unheard of in Hong Kong. So, you know, for like a skin lesion, you know, in Hong Kong, basal cell carcinoma was probably a little bit more common. And obviously I know in Australia, melanoma, it's, it's everywhere. So, I mean, those are the things that you kind of learn as you go along. But I mean, I'm afraid I don't have a clear, clear answer for this, but I guess the high yield topics that I talked about, those are the things to bear in mind as well. Would you recommend sitting the exam right after specialty training at all? If you pass the exam, then you that that passing result uh, could be valid for three years if you're engaged in clinical practice. So in other words, if you um, say you're in Australia and you come do the exam and you get through all the exam, then if you're still doing like MO training in Australia and you have three more years or whatever, then you can notify the medical council. And as long as you're actively doing something medicine anywhere in the world, then you can let them know and they will typically defer you up to three years. So you can finish out. But if you're just fresh from your, where you graduate, your country of origin, and you just did um, your, your training then, then that, may, that will be longer than those three years. So you have to kind of take that into consideration. So I think it really depends on where you are in your own professional timeline. Mm, okay. I think I would just uh, like to supplement on these questions as well because different special some specialties are not recognized in Hong Kong like for example surgery if you get certain specialty trainings overseas are not recognized in Hong Kong like uh, ICU would be recognized in Hong Kong medicine as well so I guess this question also really depends on what sort of specialty you're doing as well if you really maybe just double check on what specialty you're doing if the specialty that you aim doing in Australia isn't recognized in Hong Kong, then you may plan to return to Hong Kong a little bit earlier so that you wouldn't waste your time. And, well, I wouldn't say waste, but you do have to double the time of training that you have done in Australia and then redo again in Hong Kong. So probably just double check whether the specialty that you're training in Australia is recognized in Hong Kong or not that may affect a little bit of your plan on when to return. Also, just regarding to the best timing to apply for this, I may just say the best timing to start working in Hong Kong as an intern. I remember by the time when I was an intern, I started in January, January, like the usual Australian time. But the standard Hong Kong calendar time starts at July. So most of the specialty training adapt their new trainees by July, not in January. So up on the time I finished my 12 months of uh, internship and then in 2018, generally, I was supposed to be a surgical residence in my parents' hospital. However, I got some troubles to get onto it because um, the HHR said, well, right now we noticed some shortage of manpower in other departments. Why don't you work on other places before you get back to your hospital? So actually I did a half year of service residence in ICU before I really started my surgical training in Hong Kong. So do you think carefully when you start working in Hong Kong? I think there's no best time to prepare or to complete the HKL every breath. That would be easier for you to get on your surgical training when you start your internship by July. You come along the same stream of the local students if you start on generally, sometimes you may need difficulties to get on specialty training. You may need to work for half years of uh, random work before you can get on the training that you aim for. So be careful by the time when you choose to start in Hong Kong. I wanted to okay. make a brief uh, just time out on that. Um, we're over an hour and don't worry, we, I see a lot of questions there. Well, all the panelists can see those. Um, so thank you for all those. We will definitely stay around and answer all your questions. Um, it's very helpful, it's just as a reminder to please put them into the, the Q and A function. The chat function really gets very messy. So um, help us to help you 
by putting me in the Q and A function. It's one of the buttons at the bottom of your screen there, and that will that way we'll make sure we won't miss it. Are there any differences between working as a doctor in Hong Kong without full registration and working with full registration, i.e., someone who has passed the HK licensing exam? Example: Would the training opportunities or job options be limited without full registration? So I think it's easiest to comment from personal experience, but I it depends also on how long. I think Grace alluded to this earlier that if you have a short term, just uh, uh, a year or two then a limited registration can be very helpful in that regard. Um, also, I, I wasn't you know, from Hong Kong, so I didn't really know it. So I really, I stand by having done my six years because I had no idea how long we would be here. Um, and so it's been 10 years now and we're definitely here to stay. Uh, this is where we live. And so uh, a limited registration, though, can allow you to demo the city and know if that's for you. So that can be a valuable role. It can also later get you off the internship. If you put, spent those three years working under limited registration, you've just got yourself out of the one-year internship because you're serving Hong Kong and its people and its system in a different way, which is through the limited registration. So I think that's very reasonable that th those people are exempt for, from the internship because they're, they're also serving Hong Kong just in a different capacity. Um, so are there differences in the, the treatment? Well, you know, I think like, I always think of it like the analogy of having, you know, your citizenship somewhere versus being on a visa somewhere. So whatever your country is that you're right now, say you're in Australia or the UK or whatever, it's like, are you, you know, do you have like the, the UK or Australia citizenship or permanent residency and you can just be there indefinitely and you have that peace of mind or are you just on a student visa and that has to get renewed? I know that when I was on limited registration, they have since changed it. But when I did it, it was renewable only every year, like every year. And that was finally when I decided, you know, I think it's better to go ahead and get the full registration because every year I had to submit and you know, it's a little stressful, even though it's pro you're probably going to get renewed, but you just never know. And I have a wife and kids here. And you know, if you want stability, in other words, then I highly recommend that at some point you bite the bullet and just go ahead and, and do it. Just do, do the full um, license. Um, in terms of the training, um, I think there are limits for the, the limited registration. I'm not, maybe I think that depends by specialty, but I don't, I don't want to give you the wrong information either. But I think overall, it's a good long-term one. I did also want to relay this to one of the other questions in the, in the Q and A. And that was that if you're planning to be here five years, you know, should you do the full license? Well, only that person can, can answer that question. You know, is it really worth it? Um, you know, I, I would ask them, well, what are you planning to do for five years? If you're not working, how, how is your skills going to be maintained as a doctor, for example? So I think on a number of levels, there's value in going for it. Um, and it is an achievable goal. Everyone, you know, the, the three of, of our members here for the society, and, you know, we have hundreds of members. They've all done, uh, gotten through the exam. It's definitely an achievable goal. Um, and so you may want to consider making that one yours as well. I can quickly answer the UK one. So when I talk about residency, I mean, um, so in the UK, uh, internship is two years. So that's foundation one uh, year, so FY one year. FY1 and FY2 and then you enter sort of like CMT training or um, um, you know ST1 training so when I say resident I mean the year after internships that would be the equivalent to CMT1 or IMT1 um, and um, uh, uh, ST1 and that period sort of lasts for quite a long time until you then uh, become a sort of a higher trainee so that would be maybe two or three years after your um, after you've become um, a after you've done your sort of, uh, basic medical training. So that's when you enter specialties. Apparently there's no official surgical guidelines in Hong Kong, so don't worry too much. Uh, I can tell you what you expect in the surgical exam is the basic bedside exam skills. Don't worry too much on uh, about the guidelines. Different places where different practice, even between hospitals will have different uh, practice. Uh, scheme as well. So don't be too nervous about uh, surgical guidelines. I guess most protocol driven one is the off scanning, very honest. 
So if you are preparing for the exam, do try to get on with the Hong Kong COG website or any local guidelines that we can uh, uh, down. That would be very helpful. While for other specialties exam, it's more about your knowledge, how good you know different um, theses or common rare disease, particular pediatrics. And then in practical exam, just how good you present yourself, like how you exam, how nice you go with the kids. Uh, there's always a rumor if the kids cry, you fail the exam. So it'd be nice to the kids that you're looking after in your exam. Also, how do we approach to different patients? See that uh, two questions have been dismissed. Sorry, guys. It's not because we're trying to be selfish. Um, it's just that you know it's it's against our code of conduct to share questions that have been asked um, during our exams. So unfortunately, I can't be a little bit too specific about it. But you know those books that I've mentioned, um, you know they're very useful. And talk to the local graduates as well. Um, pediatrics syndromes, they really like syndromes. Um, but no, sorry, we can't we can't tell you um, exactly what happened in our exam because. Technically, we can't do that. So sorry about that, guys. Maybe I'll just supplement a little bit of the uh, OSCE exam. Uh, yes, uh, I remember back in the day in Australia, regarding which mutations they have OSCE, but in pediatrics and uh, medicines, it's been like a long case and short cases. And yes, in surgery, after your five minutes of examination, you get one minute of uh, passion and time. And, in Oscanese, it's more about the station type of work, so not much interaction with the exam indeed. Well, for uh, medicine and pediatrics, we do have quite a longer time of uh, question, longer questions time from the exam. Like for the long case, you're expected to make a 40 minutes of uh, patient inter interactions interview with uh, the system together. And then in the next 20 minutes, you get to present your case, also the problem symptoms and, and physical finding and shortness of the problem list. And the examiner will go on asking questions for the remaining time for in the total 20 minutes. While in pediatrics, it's about like 20 minutes of patient interactions and 10 minutes questioning time from this examiner. Uh, it may take a little bit longer if you prefer the history to be much earlier. While in the short cases, uh, it really depends on the performance, like if you exit everything quick and fast. In the shorter time, then the examiner will get a longer time to ask you questions, interact with you more. So it's more or less similar to Australia, but uh, you expect to have a little bit longer time with the examiner or the questioning on what you found, what you think, apart from differential diagnosis, do you ask for even the management plan? Not like what you are uh, in the mass pool we just talked about for. After this, I think I'm going to investigate with this, or just this more differential diagnosis, how your management plan, or even if such a case, how the TR make uh, the treatment method can go with the usual way. So uh, it's a little bit different from um, the OSCE that I had in Australia. It's more challenging on the questions that you would receive from the examiner. Mm, what else we have? Uh, management plan. Oh, okay. Let me complete that one. Um, well, maybe the last talk about atrial fibrillation. I remember by the time when I was in Australia, we may start on the magnesium sulfate, probably, but in Hong Kong, uh, you may start with amyodera IV, bolus to IV amyodera straight away. So, uh, even like a uh, hypercalemia, um, probably in Australia we use salvitamol maybe, but Hong Kong, there's no salvitamol uh, liberalized in Hong Kong after the SARS era, so never prescribed. I had it done in my first week and <laughs> it was a big, big drama in my work that by the time when I prescribed uh, salvitamol liberalized, there's no liberalized in Hong Kong. But uh, don't panic, don't panic, um, there's always some uh, uh, books that you can reference from, like what I said, once you get in, to working in Hong Kong as an intern, you will get the housemate handbook that you have, like different conditions, what you should do, what you should do, and it's all listed there clearly, and you can follow them easy. 
And so even for the exam, I think probably you can get your way to better to the resources that can reference the Hong Kong local guidelines as well. And don't panic too much in the except not everything about the local guidelines. There's always other areas that you should remember. So don't just panic about the guidelines. Your general knowledge is on different conditions and what you should right, like the reflex signs on different things that you should be uh, noticed. So the local guidelines just a small part of our, the local epidemiology, local guidelines are just a little part of the exam. So don't drill yourself about the guidelines as well. Be general on what you should be thinking. By the time when you get on working in Hong Kong, you will know the Hong Kong way to treat all the diseases like within one to two weeks. So it wouldn't be a problem. It wouldn't be a problem as you experienced doctor in Australia. Thank you.